Okay, so let's see what we're in store for. What are these things that I've got to remember about DNA structure? I'm not looking forward to this. I know that you're not either. But this is something that we have to go through. So we might as well just start off with the first bullet point and work ourselves all the way through. And up at the top, we're going to see DNA is composed of two polynucleotides. Strands that wind together in a right-hand twist. So that's important. We kind of knew two strands were involved already. We've drawn those examples. We've called them the major or the um, strand and then the complementary strand. So we talked about the complementary strand, the base pairs actually hooking up together in AT and GC fashion, and then we get this kind of run or this ladder basically of this DNA molecule. Well, this two-stranded molecule will turn and you've got to imagine a screw so imagine how the screw is turning on the end right that's how it goes into the wood okay well the DNA is turning in the same exact way we see a coil of DNA begin to be uh, twisting on itself and this twist is in a right-hand form. So it is a right-hand twist, not a left-handed twist. So imagine looking at the clock, and if you look at the clock, clockwise would be a right-handed twist. Counterclockwise would be a left-handed twist. So DNA turns right-handed. The diameter of DNA is 20 angstroms. So we kind of talked about an angstrom. We know what an angstrom is supposed to be. If you forgot what an angstrom was, one angstrom is 0.1 nanometers. Super, super tiny. Nan nanometer, that's 10 to the ninth. So this is 0.1 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. 0.0000000001, right? So super, super tiny, but it's still a molecule that we can see with our naked eye because of its length. The two strands of DNA run anti-parallel. We've also talked about that before as well. We write down the first strand in a 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. And then when we brought in the complementary strand, we saw that it ran opposite, 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Okay, so it runs anti-parallel. The two strands wrap around each other in this corkscrew fashion. So I should take this ladder, and I should take the ladder and twist it on itself. And when this twist happens, it will go right-handed, and that creates this coil. The bases, A, T, G, C, and U, they are in the core of the helix. That is what we call that twist, that corkscrew. We call it the helix. So the bases are on the inside of the nucleic acid. So they're kind of embedded in. They're kind of hidden in a way. The sugar that we've talked about, ribose or deoxyribose, and the phosphate group that connects all of the nucleotides together, they make up the backbone of the DNA molecule. So that means that on the outside of the surface, we should see sugars and we should see phosphates. The inside of that corkscrew, we are going to see the bases. So the sugars and the phosphates are loaded with OH groups. That's very important because that means that the outside of this DNA is very polar. They're loaded with OH groups. They are loaded with polarity. Not only that, but phosphates have two oxygens as well that have a pKa of 2. So that means at a pH of around 7.4, 7.5 physiological pH, these oxygens are negative. So not only do we have polar groups, but we also have groups that carry a full negative charge, making it even more polar. And what makes that a very good setup for us is that all of these negatives 
because that's what all these groups do, repel nucleophiles. Nucleophiles are bad, right? So when it comes to nucleophiles, we said that nucleophiles attack electrophiles. These things are negative. They go in and they try to find something positive to pull from. Well, the DNA molecule itself is negative. So nucleophiles do not want to go in and attack the DNA molecule. So Mother Nature was very creative yet again. She made this thing that had to be very stable basically become a barrier for nucleophilicity. So no nucleophiles will come into the DNA and begin to cleave it. Well, I say no, but there are a few out there that do behave and integrate with DNA, but very, very few of them. So those things are bad. Those are mutagenic compounds that we want to stay away from. But for the most part, no nucleophiles will want to go and attack the DNA backbone because it's loaded with negatives and it's loaded with OH and other polar groups. The bases in the center, like we've said before, are flat. And the flat surfaces, you've got to think of as kind of like a ladder. So imagine a ladder laying up or leaning up against a wall. You have a run to the left and a run to the right. Those are your sugar backbones. So the sugar goes up and down and up and down. That's connected by phosphates. The middle of the ladder, where you would put your feet, the runs, the steps, those pieces represent the bases. So the bases are in the center and they are perfectly flat. Now, flat is good and flat is bad. Purine and pyrimidine matching up means that these are going to be the same width from top to bottom. We don't really get a wiggle wobble in the actual DNA molecule. Now, if pyrimidine and pyrimidine paired up, or purine and purine paired up, we would see wider runs and shorter runs. And I don't know about you, but if I saw a ladder that had different lengths to put my feet on, I probably wouldn't trust it that much, right? And it looks like it wouldn't be as stable. So by pairing up a purine with a pyrimidine every time, we keep the length or the diameter the same. It's constant from top to bottom. And that's another reason that Mother Nature begins to pair up these purines and pyrimidines and try to maximize the hydrogen bonds with it. So hydrogen bonds, of course, stabilize the structure. It is the glue or extra glue that holds the molecule together. There are 10 base pairs for every turn of the corkscrew. So if you begin to look at the turn, well, when it comes to a full turn, there's 10 base pairs that are in there in order for that to happen. We say that DNA has a pitch, which means how tall does the molecule go for every turn, and that pitch is 34 angstroms. Base pairs can be exchanged without altering the DNA structure. So that means I can take a GC out and put a CG in and nothing changes because of that. I can take a GC out and put an AT in and the width does not change because of that. So again, that's one of the reasons that they pair up the way that they do. And finally, down at the bottom, you're going to see that DNA forms what we call a minor group groove and a major groove. And we need to talk about how to pick out what we call a minor groove and a major groove. Well, a groove is a notch. Minor means small, major means large, right? So we should probably see notches in the DNA molecule that are bigger than some of the others. And we call this major and minor groove. So in the PowerPoint, you're going to see a YouTube link. And when you click on the YouTube link, it will take you to a video that I would like for you to watch. We're not going to watch it here, but I'm going to trust that you will copy and paste this into YouTube and go and watch the video, please. Okay, so with that said, we'll stop the video here. Uh, in the next video, we'll take a look at what the minor and major groove is and how to pick out the mo major and minor groove. And we'll go back to the story of Watson, Crick, and Franklin and begin to talk about the importance of what they did with the X-ray crystallography.